The following message is by Pastor John Piper. More information from Desiring God Ministries is available at www.desiringgod.org. The Lord shines very brightly in His Word. And I invite you to take your Bibles or one from the pew in front of you and turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13 where the light becomes very, very, very penetrating. As you will see from verse 12, it's on page 1423 in the Pew Bible. If you're not familiar with where Hebrews is, 1423, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Let's pray and ask God to make his light shine with life-changing intensity into us as we begin. Oh, Father in heaven, I ask that your word would now come with power. It is living, it is active, it is sharper than a two-edged sword. It penetrates and pierces to soul, spirit, joints, marrow, judging the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Would you cause it to have a life-changing effect in every heart? Let none of us, I plead with you, let none of us leave unbelieving. Make us, by the power of your word, believers. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We want to believe, Father. Help our unbelief. Beget strong faith in your promises among your people. Banish belief in the lies of sin. And cause us to cherish the promises of God. In his name we pray, our Lord Jesus. Amen. Now before I read these two verses, I want to read verse 11. And make sure that we understand the connection between verses 11, which we ended on last week, and verse 12. Verse 11 says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Now the rest he's talking about, if you weren't here last week, is the restful salvation of God being forgiven, being welcomed into God's fellowship, and ultimately into heaven when we die. So be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall through following the same example of disobedience. Now whose example is it talking about? Who's he talking about? Remember, he's talking about the example of the Israelites in the wilderness who didn't enter the rest of God. They fell in the wilderness instead of entering the promised land, which was symbolic of the ultimate rest and would have been a wonderful temporal rest. But they didn't enter because of disobedience. But what was the essence of the disobedience? Chapter 3, verse 19. So we see that they were not able to enter Because of unbelief. Unbelief is what kept them out of the rest. Unbelief is the essence of the disobedience in verse 11. Unbelief in what? The answer is given in verse 2 of chapter 4. This is all review from last week. I mean, yeah, last Sunday. Chapter 4, I mean, chapter 4, verse 2, we have had good news preached to us just as they also, namely the Israelites, had good news preached to them just as they also, but the word they heard, that's what they didn't believe. The word, keep that in your mind, that phrase, the word, because that's what's coming out in verse 12 in a minute. The word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. So now we've seen from 3.19, chapter 4, verse 2, 
chapter 4, verse 11, that the Israelites heard a word. It was the gospel, according to verse 2. It was promise. It was mercy. It was forgiveness. It was welcome. And when they heard it, they said, we'd rather go back to Egypt. Thank you. We don't trust you to provide water, to provide food, to, to beat these tall people in the promised land. We just don't believe it. And they fell and they did not enter the promised land. And verse 11 says to us, be diligent so that that does not happen to you. Strive to enter God's heavenly rest by being vigilant not to be unbelievers like they were. Not to disbelieve the word or the promises of God. Now the link with verse 12. We've got the word before us from verse 2. It was that that they disbelieved. It's that that constitutes the disobedience of verse 11. Now here's the connection. Be diligent with that word so that you don't fail to enter the rest. For the word of God is living and active. Now just stop there. I know if you have an NIV, the word for is dropped for some inexplicable reason. That's an absolutely crucial connecting word here. The connection is, verse 11, be diligent with the word to know it, love it, believe it, trust it, rest in it, be satisfied by it, lest you become an unbeliever and don't enter the rest of God for... The Word of God is living and active and sharp and penetrates to the bottom of your life and reveals what's worth trusting and not trusting. Some of you are uh, big picture people and some are little picture people. It starts when you're a little teeny person, 11 months old. Let me use the fancy words for big picture and little picture. The, by big picture, I mean the synth. Synthetic people, that is, who like to synthesize pieces and get a piece here and a piece there and see the, the big picture. And you don't care about a lot of details in life. You don't notice a lot of details in life. And some are the, the little picture people who are analytical people. So you got the synthetical and the analytical. And analytical people take things apart and they like to, to see the pieces. And it starts when you're little. We've got Talitha now. So I'm learning these things all over again. She's 11 months old. You put this shiny, new, big toy in front of her with levers and bells. What does she do? There's a little teeny weeny chip missing from the paint on the right hand bar. And she looks at it and goes like this. And just spends two minutes just going like this. I said, grab a lever. <laughs> do something with it. Get the big picture. She's... I, I'm going to be interesting to watch now if that just holds true right on through her life. But I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to people who are somewhere on that continuum between the big picture people and the little picture people, the analytic people and the synthetic people. And you read the Bible very differently. That's why my preaching does not appeal to everybody. Because I tend to be um, picky. I pick words out and I pull verses apart and I say this word and this word and they feel like this. Now, I want to say something to the big picture people just so you don't get lost. I want to say the big picture in Ephesians, uh, what book are we on? Hebrews 4. The big picture in Hebrews 4 has four stages. So here it is, you big picture people who get lost when I talk about four and because and therefore and how it all hangs together. Here's the big picture. Stage one. The aim of life in this chapter is to enter the rest of God. That is heaven, forgiveness, acceptance, love, joy with him forever. That's stage one. Stage two is the indispensable means of entering, namely faith, believing, trusting, being satisfied with all that God is for you in Jesus. Stage three is the indispensable means of believing, namely the word of God. 
We've got to have promises. We've got to have God speaking to us about what he intends to do for us in order to trust him so that we enter his rest. Chapter 3, verse 19 says, they entered because of belief. Well, they didn't enter because of unbelief. And chapter, I uh, forget what chapter it is, says, we entered through faith. What verse? Now, now level four or stage four, you got heaven or rest. You got faith, trust, belief. And then you've got the word of God. And now the last bottom stage here is in verse 11 of chapter four, diligence. In the use of the means of the word of God so that you don't fail to appropriate the word and have the faith and enter the rest. The Christian life is a life of vigilant use of the Bible to stay believing in the promises of God. And that's what's on the front burner of this book. We'll see it again and again. Chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. Be diligent. Take heed. Listen. Exhort one another. And so on. Now, we come here to verse 11. And that's the level that we're at. We're at the level four of diligent use of the word of God so that we don't make shipwreck and fail to enter the rest that he holds out. And verse 12 is given as a reason back to the analytical level, a reason, an argument, a ground. Let me just, a lot of college students in this room here now. The college students have their class in the first hour. If you're a college student here and you didn't go to that class called Toshavim, Philemon, stand up. Philemon is the leader of that class. Thank you. Now you can sit down. You all know Philemon here. Philemon is the leader of the Toshavim group. And if you didn't come to the first hour, you're all welcome to come to the first hour. Now the reason I draw attention to college students is because nobody told me at Wheaton College. And I wasn't, I didn't learn it until... I went to seminary and had one teacher, who's the only teacher who said it, is obvious, is that for some reason, for about 23 years of my life, I saw Bible statements as strings of pearls. And you take a pearl and you admire it and you make use of it, and put it back, take another pearl. And nobody until 1960 Eight in the fall in a hermeneutics class with Dan Fuller told me they're not strings of pearls. They're links in a chain and they're connected by therefores, becauses, in order that's, all those, because apostles argue. They give extended lines of reasoning. And when I saw that, my whole world changed. Close parenthesis. Verse 12 begins with because. Even though the NIV doesn't care about what I care about. It's there in the NASB, the RSB, the King James Version and the Greek, which is what counts. And it's because. Now, this is important because verse 11 is the main point of this whole book. Be vigilant in living the Christian life, lest you fall short of heaven. For, here's your argument, here's your reason, here's your foundation, here's your ground, here's the way to get there, here's the means of fighting, here's the way to win. For, the word of God is sharp, it's living, it's active. It pierces to the division of soul and spirit, both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, this is a classic verse to frustrate a preacher because every word in it demands a sermon. I mean, aren't you sitting there right now wondering soul and spirit? What's the difference between a soul and a spirit? Aren't you wondering, what in the world do joints and bone marrow have to do with the word of God? Aren't you wondering, does the pair living and active maybe relate to the pair soul and spirit, joints 
and marrow. Hmm. Aren't you wondering as you get to the end of the verse, heart. Oh, another piece of my body. What, what does heart have to do with soul and spirit and joints and marrow? And I'm not going to talk about any of that. Isn't that frustrating to you? It frustrates me because I would have to preach for about 16 years on this book to preach that way. To take every piece like that. So I leave that for you to contemplate. And here's what I'm going to do with this verse. We've got a little forest here and a lot of trees. And I don't want to get lost among the trees and miss the glory of the forest. Let me try to state the beauty of the forest in one sentence. And here's here's the sentence. See if you would agree. The word of God penetrates very very deep. That, that covers about six of those words. Just very, very deep. Like a sword through tough, hard layers. I'll talk in a minute about what I think those layers might be. And when it gets down there to wherever it's going at the bottom, it starts Judging thoughts and intentions. That's my interpretation of verse 12. But let me try to fill it out. Take the word judging. If you, uh, I use baseball cards in the first hour because there's a lot of kids in that service. I use uh, a car in this hour. If you are trying to buy a car and you drive your car to a mechanic and you drive the car in and you say, what's your judgment? On this car. You don't mean what's your condemnation. Judgment is not just condemnation. When you hear the word judging, you see the word judging there? To judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. For years, I read this verse as condemnation. I read this verse as mainly threat, not encouragement. I'm going to try to redo that for myself this morning and maybe for you. Judging is a two-pronged activity, right? What's your judgment of this car? And he says, well, good tires, good brakes, uh, don't hear any clicks, transmission not so good. And his judgment proceeds on what's good and what's bad in the car. I believe the Word of God, when it gets to the bottom of the layers, having penetrated through all the stuff, that we try to hide with, it starts saying what's good and what's bad down there. But not that's not quite right. It's not quite right because the issue isn't just what's good and bad in in me. The issue in this chapter is what's believing and unbelieving in me. What John Piper needs help with is more specific than word of God. Show me my badness and my goodness. That's not the way I, I I don't think the Bible wants us to quite think like that. It's enough badness to just make me feel awful. And there's not any goodness except what God puts there. So that's not quite the issue. The issue is when the word gets to the bottom, does it find a believer Does it find faith in the promises of God? Does it find a cleaving to mercy? Does it find somebody who's leaning hard on the promises to take care of me? Or does it find somebody who's beginning to trust in compromise and expediency and the lies of sin? The issue at the bottom where the word of God goes is faith. Does the word of God find faith? And the way it exposes whether there's faith there is with promises. That's why I spent five minutes at the beginning of this sermon linking this verse with verse two of chapter four. Because in verse two of chapter four, it says we have had the gospel preached to us, the good news preached to us, just as they did. But the word did not profit them because it did not meet with faith. 
The word is the same word as in chapter 12. And so the word is good news, not condemning news. It's good news. So the gospel, good news, promises, mercy, forgiveness, goes down there into the bottom of my heart and starts shining its bright light all over the place. And you know what's exposed? Unbelief. When a beautiful, all-satisfying promise of God stares me in the face at the bottom of my life, and I am turned from it, loving and trusting something sinful, I am helped and delivered. This is an encouraging, delivering word. Let me give you an illustration from this week. This week, I got to do, I had to do one of those things that is not a favorite part of my ministry as a pastor. I had to make about three phone calls, all of which were very painful. They were painful because they all involved disagreement and conflict. I don't like to make phone calls like that. It feels every time like it's a no-win situation. I could either compromise a principle or a truth or a conviction that I and the staff have and trust that or... I could stand with the principle and the truth and the conviction and almost know for certain I'm going to be misunderstood and disapproved. And when you when you have to make phone calls like that, you just stare at the phone and <laughs> ask for Jesus to come back. <laughs> now, you know what the most important thing in that moment is? The most important thing at that moment is, do I trust God? Do I trust the promises of God instead of trusting wording twists or trusting timing or trusting expedient compromise or trusting a half truth and leaving out a little bit? Do, do I trust that or do I trust God? And his promises, I'll help you, I'll strengthen you, I'll hold you up, I'll work for you, I'll pursue you with goodness and mercy. That's the issue. So if that's the issue, if faith is the issue, what do I do? There's a battle going on. There's a battle going on in you this week. You're all facing some stuff which you might trust promises of God about or you might start trusting yourself or some compromising way about. What do you do? I'll tell you what I did. It's real simple. Nothing new. Number one, you, you, uh, marinate your mind in the Bible. So that it starts to smell like Bible. When you open your mouth and speak, it smells like, whoo, that's Bible breath. That's good. That's number one. You, you soak in the Bible. Number two, you email all your small group members. Now, not every small group is wired up yet, but that's coming. Everybody be on email in the world soon. We're all on email. So I emailed Tom Steller, David Michael and Sally, uh, Brad Nelson, Chuck Morris, um, Tom Steller. I say that? Five of them, I think. I emailed them all and I told them my situation. I told them the conflict. I told them my struggle and I asked them for counsel. I, and I said, I gotta have it by Thursday morning. So psh, there they were. Four answers on Thursday morning. And I read them carefully. Irv, he sent one. Tom sent one. David Michael sent one. David Livingston's out of town. And there they were. I read them. And I got help from these word-rooted words of counsel. Talked to Noel as we took our little walk down on, on uh, what's the name of that island? Pikes Island down at the Fort Snelling Preserve. That's where we took our day off walk this week. And we talked about this issue. And we prayed. So I, I, I marinated my mind. I emailed my small group. And I talked to my wife, and then I got on the phone on Friday morning and made the call. 
and God, I think, helped, and there was warmth, I think, and we'll see how it goes. What I'm illustrating here is chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, as well as chapter 4, verse 12. Let your eyes run up the page a minute. Chapter 3, verse 12. Take care, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. That's my fear, folks. I fear unbelief. I fear unbelief more than anything in the world. I don't want to be an unbeliever. I don't want to make a phone call and find myself trusting in lies. I want to trust in God. I want to be a believer and not fall away from the living God. Verse 13, encourage one another day after day. That's why I emailed my brothers in my group. I need daily encouragement, guidance. So do you. That's why you need to be in a small group or have some kind of connectedness with people who care enough about you that they're in your face asking how you're doing with your work and whether you're Trusting in sin or trusting in God? As long as it is called today, lest there be in any of you, lest any one of you be hardened. Now, here comes a very crucial phrase. By the deceitfulness of sin. Mark that. The deceitfulness of sin. Would you agree that the only reason you sin is because you believe at that moment the lie of the sin. That things will go better this way. Or at least the the charge of the moment will be worth the misery of the consequences. That's the lie of Satan. Now, I said Satan and caught myself in the first hour and corrected it to sin And a woman came up to me afterwards. She said, why would you correct yourself? The reason I'm correcting myself now, as well as then, when I said, lie of Satan, no, no, not. Just get Satan out of this sermon. He's not in this sermon. Sin is in this sermon. The lie of sin. It says, do you see the phrase? The mark it. It's not my phrase. At the end of verse 13 in chapter 3, the deceitfulness of sin. Sin lies. Satan's a liar, sure. But we we talk way too much about the lies of Satan. You got enough sin in you rooted deep in your own heart to keep you deceived the rest of your life if Satan falls down dead. Satan's not the big problem in this world. I'm the big problem in this world. John Piper's carnality is the big problem in my marriage. And my parenting and my pastoring and my citizenship and everything else where I cause trouble. I'm the problem. Satan doesn't get the credit for that. All he can do is come in and give boosters to my sin. I get that from Ephesians 2, 2 and 3. and we'll Study that later. I'm the problem. When I get deceived, my sin is deceiving me. Sin is rooted in me, according to chapter 6. And seven in Romans. It's like a power in me. And Paul cries out, oh, this sin that's rooted in me. Satan's not even mentioned in chapters Romans 6, 7, and 8. So that's why I corrected myself and said, the issue here, when I got on the telephone or as I struggled with the phone, and as you're struggling today and this week, with whether you're going to trust God's promises or trust expediency and, and sin, the issue there is, Do you get deceived by the lies of sin? Sin says to you, for example, the only way you'll have any future is if you get an abortion. That's one of them. Or it says to you, the only way you're going to have any future is if you cheat on this test. You won't make it through school if you don't cheat. That's that's a promise. That's a promise. Sin only has power through promises. Or it might say, you won't attract him if you don't dress provocatively. You don't need Satan to tell you that. Sin will just tell you that. Or you will lose him or her if you don't compromise your sexual standards. And you feel so fulfilled and accepted and loved when you're around him or her. That's the lie. That Satan is promising. Or 
Satan, sin, says, you won't have any job security if you speak out about the dishonest practices at your office. Or it says, your only hope for future is to get out of this marriage relationship because it is one hell. Or it says, if you go on looking weak like you do and getting stepped on and don't take some kind of revenge, your life is going to be miserable. The only reason any of you sins is because you believe those promises. It's the only reason I sin. In the moment when sin offers its little tricky half-truth, you will be like God. You believe it. And in believing it, you stop believing in the promises of God. And that's what's at stake every day in the Christian life. And that's why this book of Hebrews was written to make us vigilant over unbelief so that we'll trust in the promises of God and not believe in what verse 13 of chapter 3 calls the deceitfulness of sin. And here's the problem, one of the deep problems. Sometimes those lies got into you when you were small or a teenager or 20 years old or 40 and the deceptions of sin began to layer themselves over creating a pocket of almost impenetrable conviction that this must be so. I really can't be happy unless... And let sin fill in the blank. Let sin fill in the blank. And the layers are so thick that if somebody comes along and says, you know, that's wrong. That's harmful to you. What do you mean? It's my only hope of happiness. How could it be harmful to me? And there is no touching it. It is so deep and so powerfully rooted beneath all the layers of deception that sin has used. That's why verse 12 is in this book. To give you an encouragement that as you struggle and are diligent with the deceit of the promises of sin you will know that the promises of God are powerful. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It penetrates down to that division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and it gets beneath all those layers of deception. And when it gets there, it starts assessing with promises superior promises at the bottom of all the layers is not you dirty, lousy, no good sinner, which is, of course, true. But that doesn't rescue us. What rescues us is, look, I am a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, keeping faith with thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. My son has died for sinners. All sin can be removed. I hold out promises to pursue you with goodness and mercy all your days and bring you into a rest that will satisfy your heart forever and ever. That's what the word, the light of verse 2 of chapter 4 sheds down there. And what it does is suddenly it causes the half-truths of sin to be exposed for the lies that they are. And it's freedom. When the word of God gets in there like that, the picture I had in my mind, and I totally blew it in the first hour because I don't know anything about rocks and wood, but I get it right this time. The picture I had in my mind yesterday, even though the terminology is wrong, the reality of it's okay, is that there's at the bottom of our lives, tucked away for most of us, some darkness. And in the darkness, a little bit of a flicker we can still see, there's these little Little black, I called them stones in the first hour because I thought ebony was a stone and now somebody tells me it's wood. Okay, so there's these little piece of ebony, hard, pretty, shiny, the kind of thing you'd put on a necklace, hang around your neck, and you pick up this little piece of ebony and you look at it. Oh, this is valuable. I want to live for this. I will put this in my pocket. And then suddenly, the word of God 
All the layers come off. The windows fly open and the light streams in. And what you got in your hand? A roach. It's a roach. Yeah. That's the way the word of God works. As long as the layers are there, the, the little tentacles, the little fuzzy parts of the roach, he just folds himself in. It's just a shiny back. It's like a, I, I said stone in the first hour. Okay, shiny hard piece of wood, got it? But it's valuable. It's the kind of thing you put on a neck. So, and, and it shows its shiny side to you. Sin, mm, pick me up. Feel me. I feel good. That's why sin talks. Steal, lie, adultery, lust, pride, half-truths. Pick me up. I'm good. I'm valuable. Life becomes better when you do it like this. I was at Pizza Hut yesterday watching my 20 minutes of TV a week and and Vince Lombardi is on there walking into the sunset with his football and saying, there's more to life than football, but not much. I said to Barnabas, that's a lie. It's another lie. Football is a little teeny, weeny, weeny part of life. Not almost the whole thing. Or you're sick. The TV is filled with half-truths, putting the shiny side of the roach to you so that in the darkness of deception, it'll feel like a piece of ebony and you'll pick it up and you'll build your life on it. And the only hope for us is verse 12 of chapter 4. Right through. And there it is, opening up. The light is shining. This is not condemnation. This is gospel shining on those roaches. I mean, would you not... If your house were dark and you were going around picking up little roaches and put them in your pocket because you thought they were valuable pieces of ebony, would you not want somebody to open the window? I think you would. And then you would do what's called... Anybody know the religious word for this? (laughs) What's the religious word for that? Guess. It's repentance. Repentance. So now I'm done. This is the end of the sermon. And we're at a crisis point. Now, I haven't said a word about verse 13. Chapter 4, verse 13. Just no time. But here's, here's the point of verse 13. The point of verse 13 is to say, folks, there's a crisis right now. In the next two minutes as we close, there's a crisis. And the crisis is this. The word of God, as imperfectly as I have done it, has been preached this morning. It has penetrated for some of you to a new level and some stuff has been laid open. That's coming this week or came last week. Something now looks like a roach more than it did when you walked into this room. And verse 13 says, you are right now naked before God. You are open and laid bare. He knows exactly what your conscience is telling you right now about what's been happening. He sees it all. You can't hide anything in your heart or mind from him. In fact, he knows far more than you do about it. And that creates a crisis because what the Lord is saying to you right now is, all right, I have penetrated through John Piper's exposition of my word a little deeper and I've shown you some things. What are you going to do? I'm watching and I see everything. And I want you to do two things. Very simple. One, turn away from the lies and the promises of sin. Recognize them for the roaches that they are. And turn toward the promises of God. We got... Religious lingo for this, but I don't want, I don't want it to be worn out in your ears. This is called repentance. Get out of my life, you roaches. I'm sick of it. Get out of my life. I hate you. You renounce sin. You become an enemy of sin. 
You declare war on sin. And then you turn to this light streaming through the window, which says, oh, it's so much better. Blessed are the pure in heart. They're going to see God. And you embrace the promise and you feed on it. And that's faith. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd give repentance and that you'd give faith by the power of your revealing word of promise. I thank you for the gospel, that there's forgiveness for roach loving. I thank you for the promise that there's cleansing from all the leavings that these roaches have messed us up with. And I thank you that there's a future with you both in this life and in the life to come that is whole. It will always be a battle. That's what verse, that's what this whole book of Hebrews is about. A battle to keep on believing, trusting. So would you draw people out of trusting promises of sin and into trusting promises of God? Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before the throne of his glory with rejoicing and without any blemish at all. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to him be glory before all time, now and forever and ever. And all the people said, Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you for listening to this message by John Piper, pastor for preaching at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Feel free to make copies of this message to give to others, but please do not charge for those copies or alter the content in any way without permission. We invite you to visit Desiring God online at www.desiringgod.org. There you'll find hundreds of sermons, articles, radio broadcasts, and much more, all available to you at no charge. Our online store carries all of Pastor John's books, audio, and video resources. You can also stay up to date on what's new at Desiring God. Again, our website is www.desiringgod.org. Or call us toll-free at 1-888-346-346. 4700. Our mailing address is Desiring God, 2601 East Franklin Avenue, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55406. Desiring God exists to help you make God your treasure, because God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him.